Okay, yesterday we discussed how um, JJ Thompson, roughly how JJ Thompson um, proclaimed his discovery of the electron, and we used he used a crossed field effect. Now, in that situation, uh, we saw that the beam of electrons coming in was in a vacuum, and they were affected both by a B field that was set up ahead of time, and also by an E field that was set up ahead of time. Although it might have been you know, they might have switched one field off and then turn it on or adjust one or play around with it. Um, the charges that came in were uh, a beam of electrons flying via, through a vacuum and ended up basically being double deflected, deflected by both fields but in opposite directions. After creating a balancing effect, we're able to learn basically the mass over charge ratio of the uh, electron. And Having repeated the experiment multiple times, I'm sure that uh, the M over Q continued to come out to a similar constant each time. So uh, today we're going to talk about something a little different. This is a situation where we have a wire. So what you see here in the diagram is a, a copper wire running up through the page. And uh, imagine if we put a current going through this copper wire going this direction. Okay, so what it really means is the electrons are flowing with their own drift velocity upwards, right? Because we know current is really defined as the flow of positive charge carriers. Okay, and then imagine that um, the, the particles uh, in the, the electrons you know, that are actually traveling along here get uh, influenced by the B field. So uh, what you see here in the, the light gray is our B field and it is directed into the whiteboard as we talked about yesterday. Well, what happens to these electrons as they come in? Well, they, they're going to feel a force, a magnetic force. So if you use your right hand, um, you might at first get the impression that since you're pointing your forefinger in the direction of the velocity, right? So here's your thumb, here's your forefinger, right? Um, these are your fingernails. <laughs> you're pointing it in, in the direction of the velocity, but um, you would get the impression that the right hand rule if you aim your middle finger into the board, you might get the impression that the, the force is going to be felt to the left. But remember, the formula is actually F equals Q V cross B. So although V cross B is to the left, um, the charge of the electrons are, of course, negative. So actually, it might almost be better to use the left hand here. Uh, in any case, the force is actually felt to the right. All right? Okay, and so <clears throat> erase the purple and put in the green. The green will be the, uh, the initial feel, anyway, of the force, the initial tug. And uh, it causes the electrons, of course, to deflect and to deflect in a uh, rightward fashion. Okay, now we assume that the current is going to continue. Uh, in other words, the wire has on it some battery somewhere. So there's still a pull for these electrons to make it through the wire. So they're not going to go and undergo circular motion, but imagine them kind of still flowing this way upwards, but sort of more collected over onto the right side of the wire. So I'm sure this all happens very, very quickly. As soon as the electrons enter the field, they quickly make their way over to the right and travel the right side. The way we drive in America is to drive on the right side of the road, so it kind of looks like a driver who is, oh, I'm in the middle of the road, and then just kind of, you know, oh, I better get on my side of the road kind of thing. Okay, so what actually happens, though, to the copper atoms? Because remember, these electrons are not <clears throat> the free electrons, but they're part of the, the copper atom system, right? <clears throat> the copper atom lattice here. And so... We, we understand that um, there are positive then charge carriers waiting on the other side for their negatives. And they're not coming because they've taken to the right side as a preference because of the B force. Now, this little polarization effect causes then a new field to emerge. Uh, it is an E field, almost as if it, this was like a parallel plate capacitor kind of sort of thing, okay? So let, let's just say that um, this E field operates across the distance D, which happens to be the, the gauge of the wire, the diameter of the wire. Um, if that's the case, then we have uh, basically a, something similar to a capacitor, almost like a parallel plate capacitor. 
So anyway, the, um, the potential across the wire is not exactly zero, is it? Okay, so that's really an interesting phenomenon. Now, any further electrons coming into the, this region now would experience from this induced E field, this polarization effect, they would feel a pull to the left. So while we might expect the electrons to completely drive on the right side of the road, actually they will also be um, scattered um, somewhat through the copper as well. Now, I still say there's more negative to the right than the left, but maybe not quite as much um, because of this purple E field. Remember that uh, the electrons are technically collect, uh, attracted to the left side, right? They're collecting on the right, but not as much because they also feel a pull to the left. So the force to the right, you could say, has been diminished by what we call this, the Hall effect. So this is called the Hall effect. Okay, an effect is something that happens and um, it happens behind our back. Uh, it happens because of some natural phenomenon. Uh, no laws are being violated, nothing new is happening. It's just maybe something we might not have foreseen, um, but it, it causes something in nature to react uh, with or without our permission. Okay, so <clears throat> interesting little scenario there. Now, please understand that this E field is a gradually changing thing. I mean, not like take doesn't take like a long time, but it um, it grows in magnitude. Okay, and so the reason it grows in magnitude is simply because uh, there are more electrons flowing in at every second. So as they're flowing in, and they're also leaving, but um, this effect becomes stronger over time, and eventually the particles then begin to take paths that are more or less straight through the wire. So, you know, at first they might have deflected a lot, but then future electrons come in and sort of mellow out in their deflection. And they're passing less, um, in a less exaggerated way. Now, will it ever happen that eventually they'll pass straight through? And the answer is yes. When the E field, right, produces a force to the left, that force is when multiplied, when you multiply the E field by Q, you get that force, right? And um, this will be hopefully eventually balanced out by the other force QV cross B. So when these two are equal, QE, which is a vector equation, excuse me, and um, QV cross B, when these are once and finally equal to each other, then uh, we have a perfect balance, right? Uh, but it takes a little bit of time. All right. Uh, now you can see that the, there will be an actual voltage difference between left and right side measurable even after this equilibrium occurs. Okay, so let's kind of draw, this is kind of our during, before and during picture. Let's draw sort of an after picture. Okay, at the end of all these, all of this, um, what we have is current more or less flowing straight through, right? Electrons, I should say, point, uh, flowing straight up. But we have, a we have actually a, a polarized uh, wire, basically. So there still is a net positive to this side and a net negative to this side. If that weren't true, then the field would, the E field would dissipate and then the, the you know, electrons would race off to the right side of the wire again. So since we expect this flow to continue straight forward. We expect the equilibrium to continue, which means this, this purple field we talked about has to continue to maintain its existence. Okay, so it reaches a critical value and then the, the equilibrium has occurred and then the blue path of electrons is straight. Um, okay, so at this instant now, you could technically put a, you know, a voltmeter on here a voltmeter and you could actually measure the potential difference. So what would the potential difference give you? That's the question. Well, we call this the Hall potential difference because it's a potential difference measured under the situation of the Hall effect. And that potential difference is V equals ED, naturally, naturally. Um, we know that because 
V is always negative of the integral of the field times ds, dotted with ds. Uh, the E is actually uniform. Uh, we can pull the E out of the integral, the integral of ds between uh, you know s equals zero and s equals d is just simply d so we basically get ed uh, the negative um, actually yeah we would we would integrate uh, from yeah we don't need the negative uh, it, it, th we're talking about a, a signed voltage but we don't care too much about the sign itself um, okay now which region is the low and which region is the high so uh, one side is the low potential one side is the high obviously the positive end is the high potential so this would be like high v low v as measured relative to ground okay so that's called the hall potential difference now let's look at the actual uh, equilibrium equations okay so we have here an electron a sample electron and it feels two forces so this is a free body diagram it feels the force of the magnetic field to the right and it feels the force of the electric field to the left. Okay, and at this instant of equilibrium, these two forces are equal. So we'll call it F electric equals F magnetic or F B field. Uh, this side is Q E, but it's an electron. So let's just put E E. The right side is Q V B sine phi. But we've intentionally designed phi to be 90 degrees. If you go back and look, at the last couple slides. Therefore, we can just write QVB, but it's an electron, so we'll write EVB. You'll notice that the actual E cancels out. Okay, this gives us E equals VB, where V is the drift velocity. So E is equal to V drift times B field. Now, if you kind of go back a little bit and you look at our current density equations from earlier, we had said that uh, if you divide current density by NE, this gives you drift velocity. So we could technically also write this as I over area. If you remember, there was a couple ways we could write drift velocity, J over NE or I over AN, A and E. See? All right, so let's go ahead and insert that into our equation. E equals VB and we're inserting the I over AIN. And it might be a good idea actually to isolate N uh, because B is predetermined, E is the elemental charge, E is predetermined, right? Um, I is predetermined. The only thing here that uh, isn't necessarily known or under our control is N. And so we end up basically getting N equals uh, it's IB over AEE. -E. So that's a, a little e, big E. A little e, big E. Let me rewrite that. All right, so what does it mean? It means that, and remember N is the number density. It's not actually the number of electrons. It's the number of electrons per unit volume is equal to the B field that we apply times the current that we enforce uh, divided by, and then this A here is the area of the cross section of the wire times the elemental charge uh, and times the E field that, we can, that we've uh, produced. And if you look also at the fact that our voltage is sometimes thought of as ED, right? You could insert that as well. So you could actually plug that in. So let's see what happens if we do that. Oh, let's scroll up a little more. So we have N equals BI over AE, and then we'd have to isolate the E here. So it's D over, uh, it's V uh, over D, V over D. That's voltage. Okay, um, then you could clean this up a little bit. Uh, actually, I'm not going to really uh, clean it up. I'm just going to basically kind of reinterpret it a little bit. I have an area divided by D there. And what do you call an area 
divided by d, uh, you call that a length. So if, if you have a width and a length, right? So let's say that you have a d this way and, and your total area is a, right? That's your total area, a. Dividing area over um, over width is going to give you length, or vice versa. If you divide area by length, you get width. So basically, this is just the length of the wire. So this would be like length of the wire. So the book has this equation. It's bi over evl, b over evil. So stay above the evil. Uh, this is the number density. It represents the number of electrons actually passing through. Interesting. Remember that we're kind of in the theoretical phase of the chapter two, so if you don't find a use for this equation, that's okay. But if you need a number uh, density, then here you have it. Okay, um, the Hall effect can be used to do a lot of other things. Um, you can actually measure drift speed using this Hall effect. Uh, you can also kind of study I guess you could sort of study copper in a sense, because if you can study the drift speed in copper, that might help you to understand the structure of copper better. So there's a lot of pro, uh, ap lab applications, I suppose, that you, know, you, could, you could do with, with this knowledge. Okay, all of this it would be, of course, reversed if we had flowed the current up the page and the electrons had moved down the page. Um, the E field would have pointed the opposite direction and so forth, so I'm sure you could sort of reconstruct the experiment from, uh, by changing that direction of your, your uh, current. So what would happen if instead of having a stationary wire and then uh, running, a wire, uh, uh, running a current through the B field, what if we had a very similar setup? I'll draw the B field. Uh, see, there's, this is your B field, and you just threw a wire, a, a, a piece of wire through it. Like a, like a javelin. Uh, let, let me increase the size of my B field real quick. So let's say that you are you have this very large permeating B field here. Okay, it just kind of permeates all of the, the, the entire board here. Okay. <clears throat> just a little bit, make it look more uniform. Okay, so let's say that this is your field, and you just took a hunk of wire, like a little piece of wire. Let's do a little, cute little rectangle here. Can I stretch him? Come on, let's stretch you. Yeah, I'm gonna stretch you. Well, I think I can't stretch you. Hold on, I wanna, I wanna stretch this little guy, so let me double click him, see if I can do anything with him. Yeah, here we go, okay. So I was gonna stretch him, and let's throw him through this way. So like an arrow, like a javelin, we'll toss him into the B field. So we're gonna toss, come here. I'll animate it, whoops, if I can. Okay, so imagine we toss it, it goes flying through like that, okay? Let me go a little smaller. Obviously you can tell Mr. Shore is not super experienced at using smart software. Okay, so this is like a little piece of wire. We throw it through like a rock. Um, straight up, <laughs> okay, like a spaceship. Now, uh, what happens as it's moving? Um, so inside this piece of metal, right? So let's put it back where it was at the bottom. Come here, good grief. Okay, uh, there are all of these, you know, protons and electrons and copper atoms, and everybody's actually stable and happy, and there's no potential differences. So positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. They're, they're all, you know, every atom is neutral, and it's all hunky dory in there, right? Okay, so when you throw it. Um, Theoretically, actually, it becomes like a current. So the, the free electrons in here uh, basically would leave their partners and head off to the right. <laughs> so here's kind of what would happen. Let's see if I can do this. Ungroup these, okay, so, okay. I'm gonna grab those little electrons on the inside. Actually, I'm just gonna erase them. Mr. Shore's gonna erase these guys. Uh, so what's going to happen is the electrons, since they're not that committed to their atoms, it's a metal, right? 
they're gonna come onto this side a little bit and uh, it's gonna start to polarize, right? Uh, this is moving, so the, you've actually, you remember you've actually thrown it. So it's moving forward and this begins to happen and then the further it flies in the field, the more it happens. And so actually it's the same effect we had before. We still get that E field to the right, you see, um, and then it starts to change in, and diminish itself and uh, basically that field vanishes eventually and so we get all the same equations um, but instead of a drift velocity it's the actual velocity of the flying piece of hunk of metal so if you kind of just go back here and you look at all these equations we wrote you just replace all the veloc drift velocities with velocity of the flying plate um, so for you know that the current or the uh, number density there or you could come back and rewrite the formula for um, let's see what was the other ones we had uh, the Hall potential difference was V equals ED uh, we don't know if we need that one anyway any formulas we wrote um, the VD is going to be a V so that's just kind of fun and uh, here are some of the ones that they came up with so when you toss then you end up with E equals VB again, but it's not drift velocity. It's the velocity of the hunk of metal flying through the room. And then the other one was voltage is equal to ED, right? This is the Hall, Hall effect uh, potential difference. Uh, you could actually insert VB here. So it's V equals VBD, where the little V is the uh, velocity. It's just fun to play around with the concept here. Okay, so the next time we talk, we'll be talking about uh, we'll talk again about the circular motion and um, you guys did a great job already deriving the period and so actually I I think I'll just uh, rederive it now in a separate video and then we'll skip over because we've already talked about it in class on actually through the Google classroom discussion board